Hi, I'm Ben Rogoff and I'm co-head of the technology team at Polar Capital. And today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about artificial intelligence. As many people know, the whole story of AI has really exploded to the fore in recent years uh, as a result of a number of key technology developments that we've seen. Most importantly, the cost of computers collapsed uh, as a result of a, a multitude of different technology breakthroughs in CPU, GPU and other custom uh, chips that are used to process at vastly cheaper prices than we've seen before. In addition, the cost of storage and a plethora of data as a result of smartphones and the overall um, growth of the internet has resulted in an incredible rich set of data uh, with which to compute. And as a result of that, Gartner a few years ago uh, discussed AI and talked about how AI would, would prove to be the most disruptive force really within technology over the coming decade. Now, I'm a historian, which means I'm probably not the right person to explain to you how a neural network works, but I'll have a stab. Here's an image from Google, and in that basket is a dog. And the way that a neural network works is to try and turn an image into a collection of colors and to then process those colors in a way that it can identify what that image is. Now, the beauty of a neural network is that it learns from its experience. And in this particular example, the image shows you that a cat is the answer, but of course it's not a cat at least it's not a cat, it's a dog. And as, as a result of force feeding data through a neural network, the neural network itself improves and ultimately gets the right answer, it's a dog. We have long been fascinated by the idea of machines being able to imitate humans. And in many domains, that happened a long time ago. We can go back to history and, and look at stocking frames or washing machines, I don't know, music boxes or cuckoo clocks. Um, in fields of me mechanization and more recently in electronics, We've seen machines uh, achieve and, of course, surpass uh, human ability in certain narrow fields. A key moment for AI occurred in 1997 when the IBM supercomputer Deep Blue managed to defeat world chess champion Garry Kasparov. And the way it did that was its ability to access 200 million potential moves every second, which, even compared to a grandmaster, was many times more than a human is capable of. More recently, in 2011, another IBM supercomputer, this time Watson, defeated two champions from US game show Jeopardy in an exhibition match. And this one was particularly impressive because this supercomputer was using natural language processing um, and enormous computational power, um, which it used to extract information from equivalent to 200 million pages um, every three seconds. Now, as a result of those breakthroughs, there's been a tremendous excitement in AI in recent years and lots of money thrown at the problem, as well as further advances in key domains like CPUs, GPUs, and what we call tensor processing units, TPUs. And as a result of that, we've seen some significant progress made in game playing by computers. Now, since 2011, we've seen some incredible breakthroughs. And the first very high profile one was in 2016 when DeepMind's algorithm, AlphaGo, vanquished the best player, best human player, I should say, uh, and solved the game effectively. And it did that with an enormous array of computational power, a baseline of hundreds of millions of human moves with which it augmented by playing games against itself. And since then, we've seen that same algorithm and the same team at DeepMind make further advances, most critically in chess. In 2017, a very key moment happened when AlphaZero algorithm, again from DeepMind, was able to, to vanquish uh, Stockfish, which at the time was the most powerful chess program on Earth. And it did this in a handful of hours by something called reinforcement learning, where effectively two neural networks played against each other and got better and better at the game and ultimately sold for chess. We've also seen similar developments occur in computer gaming, where StarCraft II has effectively been solved. It's a game by Activision played online. And again, DeepMind, using a similar algorithm, was able to defeat 99.8% of human players. Again, pretty much superhuman capability. In 2019, an even greater breakthrough, when Pluribus, an AI engine created by Carnegie Mellon and Facebook, was able to beat 12 professional poker players in a Texas Hold'em multiplayer setting. An astonishing feat when you think that it only took a handful of days to learn the game and was powered by just two CPUs, which is not that different to the power that you might have in your laptop at home. We've also seen AI engines reach superhuman capabilities in the critical domain of natural language processing. Now here's a chart that we're showing from Google, which demonstrates that over time, machines have got better and better at identifying errors in recognizing language. 
and a key breakthrough happened in 2017 when Google and others uh, after them managed to reduce that error rate to around 5%. Now humans have an error rate of about 4%. However, more recently, we've moved beyond the human capability and very much into the superhuman with new models from the likes of Microsoft today using 17 billion parameters uh, and with that able to achieve 98% grammatical accuracy. And that's why spell checkers and grammar checkers that we use every day uh, are so much better than they once were. Now with these capabilities, we're not only able to recognize language, but we're able to start enriching things like search engines, but also um, analytical engines, uh, voice assistants, uh, con conversational AI, um, and, and so many other things. We're also seeing tools, as I mentioned before, in the spelling, but also in writing, uh, and of course the holy grail, we're making huge progress in real-time translation. We've also seen AI make progress in content creation. Recently, NVIDIA used generative adversarial networks in order to recreate Pac-Man on its 40-year anniversary. One of my favorite retro games, as it happens. Uh, and it did that by taking 50,000 hours of gameplay and effectively two networks that competed against each other and without any underlying game engine or code, recreated the game. It's pretty special stuff. In the domain of art, we've also seen uh, how an AI engine was able to produce a portrait um, and that portrait sold for nearly half a million dollars uh, at auction. Uh, and that was painted entirely by an AI engine, which had been force fed 15,000 images of portraits over 500 odd years of art history. And even more spookily, we saw recently an article published by The Guardian, which was entirely written by an AI engine, uh, a very advanced one, that was able to write a 500 word article on why we shouldn't worry about the rise of robots. Again, fascinating stuff, very early days, but there is little doubt, and we've seen it in chess, that AI can be creative. Returning to the here and now, there's already plenty of examples of AI machine learning being used today. For example, at Facebook, where billions of users generating tons of data uh, enable Facebook to use machine learning for things like image recognition and real-time translation. We've also seen Netflix um, use machine learning extensively, not only in helping it uh, curate content, but also being able to generate, for example, personalized thumbnails that allow an appeal to individual users um, who spend less than two seconds, as it happens, choosing what they're gonna watch next. Spotify uses that data that we generate as customers to not only help it select songs, but to create curated playlists for us, daily and weekly playlists. Axon, in the law enforcement domain has tons of data. And with that data, they're able to apply machine learning algorithms to help with automatic redacting um, in things like video images, uh, but also helping to generate reports. Uber, with millions of drivers, riders, and billions of rides taken, are able to use machine learning and AI to help it estimate journey times or delivery times if you're ordering food, uh, and to help with dynamic pricing and so on. And in the computer gaming domain, not only StarCraft II, like we talked about earlier, but in Fortnite's case, the world's largest computer game uh, is using AI today to help it match up players and also has introduced the concept of AI bots into its game in order to help novice players gain the skills they need to take on humans. Now, the path to AI development is unlikely to prove a smooth one. In fact, it's probably more likely to follow a two-step forward, one-step back uh, path. The first outstanding issue that AI needs to deal with is hype. Ultimately, the idea of an artificial general intelligence, a how, uh, or the concept of the singularity where machines reach human characteristics across a wide range of domains is frankly unlikely in our lifetimes. In fact, AI is already shown to be most successful when it has a very narrow focus. AI will also have to contend with the charge that it will take away human jobs. Now this is one that we are more sanguine about. Ultimately, technology uh, not just AI, but technologies before it, have indeed challenged human jobs, but ultimately enabled us to move to higher value work. AI is also amplifying the issue of fake news, bad actors, and the concept of deep fakes. And as the image here shows, uh, a, a f an infamous video really of uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi that was doctored and ultimately made to look like she was slurring um, was a very good reminder of the risks associated with AI and how good uh, some of these fakes can appear um, online. 
Another key challenge for AI as it evolves will of course be privacy and what is and isn't allowable um, in any given country. For example, in California, changes were made in regulations in order to protect consumers from facial recognition technology. And finally, there's the issue of traceability. That ultimately the AI engine is unable to explain why it makes the decisions it makes. Not only is that making it difficult to justify outcomes, but it also makes it very difficult to recycle AI to new domains and new data sets. To conclude, hopefully you agree that AI represents one of the most exciting families of technologies over the coming decade. And whilst it's a controversial subject, understandably given where we are in its life cycle, I think it's fair to say that most technologies, and certainly ones that involve consumers, have often been controversial in their rapid stages of diffusion. In time, we're confident that there will be an appropriate regulatory backdrop that will help nurture and fuel the development of AI. While AI is likely to remain narrow and focused during our lifetimes, we are already capable of producing machines with human and even superhuman capabilities, and we're learning from the knowledge they produce. Thank you, Ben, that's great. Now, just a few more questions from me to follow up. Uh, what are the biggest disruptors in the technology industry? Well, as we discussed, you know, artificial intelligence is one of the most exciting uh, families of technologies coming through, but you know, really at the moment, enriching some of the other key technologies out there. And at the heart of the disruption that we see today in technology is, of course, the internet. Um, and the internet now, more than 20 years old in a kind of commercial sense, is really changing everything. It's very much what we describe as a general purpose technology around which everything is reordered and ultimately recreated. And, and we're seeing that in fields like communication and content and so on. So the stuff we're excited about, the kind of core themes within our portfolios, really relate to the internet, the delivery of software as a service. Um, we're excited about the move to online commerce, e-commerce, um, digital payments another very big one. Uh, and then there's the connectivity. Um, 5G is upon us. Uh, the Apple 5G handsets are out and we're beginning to build out 5G base stations. It's not just about a new cellular standard, it's also about uh, an ability to communicate to the edge of a network and what that um, hopefully should facilitate. Uh, things like autonomous vehicles um, and remote medicine that require you know, very low latency um, in order to operate successfully. And on top of that, we've got robotics and we've got the Internet of Things and a whole kind of panoply of emerging technologies to be excited about. What are the key themes to watch out for over the next 12 months? Over the coming 12 months, much depends on COVID and the path of the virus. Now, of course, very recently we've had good news in the form of a promising vaccine uh, candidate. Um, and, and so, you know, fingers crossed. Um, our core themes are likely to persist for the coming decade and more. But how stocks behave will depend on people's perception of the, I suppose, the permanence of the new normal that we're in right now. My gut feel is um, that even in the event of a vaccine, um, many of the changes that we've seen experienced as consumers, but also employees, uh, are likely to stick and that we aren't going to go back to working five day a week in, in an office and, and, and wearing suits apart from interviews such as this. Um, but we'll, only time will tell um, whether or not we snap back to, to the old world. Um, but our, our confidence in the technology sector um, lasts longer than over the coming 12 months. Um, you know, we've been excited about the themes that we're enjoying today for a decade, and I'm hopeful that the technology will remain at the kind of forefront of change everywhere over the coming decade. How might regulation impact the growth of the technology industry? Regulation has been uh, a hot topic um, certainly within the US technology market for some time, um, as a result really of the rise of a number of key platforms that are, I suppose, best understood as natural monopolies. Companies like Google and Facebook are reaching such scale that it makes competition difficult. Now, I've been a sort of long-term advocate um, of the view that the 19th century parallel, which people like to make between Rockefeller and other kind of robber barons as they were known at the time, and the technology companies today is frankly fallacious. You know, companies like Rockefeller that might have dominated oil and, and an oil refinery, um, I'm not sure what, quite what good that did for consumers. In contrast, you know, Google has enabled billions of people to, to learn new skills, to access information that they couldn't have before, you know, to empower themselves, frankly. Uh, and the same could be said for, for Facebook and a number of other kind of core networks. And, and so uh, my own view has been that sort of, I've always been hopeful, I suppose, that the regulatory bark would be worse than the bite. But, Nonetheless, regulation does represent a risk, 
Um, and you know, with a, a new president uh, in the White House, that risk is likely to sort of remain at the forefront for now. Um, but my gut feeling is that the very largest companies um, are, are, I'm hopeful at least, that they will um, avoid worst case scenarios. They won't be broken up. Uh, they may be subjected to slightly higher rate, rates of taxation, um, but that ultimately um, what this COVID period has hopefully demonstrated is the utility that those networks uh, and companies um, produce for, for everyone. Are the biggest risks regulatory, economic, political or fundamental or the easing of COVID-19 globally? There are always risks associated with investment and the technology sector is no uh, exception. Um, right now the technology fundamentals in Q3 have been very strong. In fact it's been one of the best reporting periods for equities, for US equities um, in sort of modern history. Um, but the tech sector remains very much at the sort of top of the tree, delivering great results, great upside to revenues and earnings relative to most other sectors. So fundamentals are strong. Um, we're also beginning to see, um, certainly in the East, um, recovery from COVID. Um, and obviously where we are, um, positive news on, on a vaccine, which should indeed, you know, hopefully, fuel a recovery in sentiment. So I'm hopeful that the economic backdrop ought to just improve from where we are today. So I guess the answer to the question uh, and the greatest risk, you know, regulation, which we've just covered, but also the path of COVID uh, and what that does for stock prices rather than the fundamentals of our companies. Whilst we have you here, what's been happening with the portfolios? Well, uh, the technology market has remained very strong. Um, obviously, the news of a potential vaccine has resulted in some near-term profit taking in the sector. But, you know, year to date performance has been, frankly, you know, fantastic um, for, for the sector. And we've been pleased with how the funds have done. Um, I would say that over the last few months, however, we've been taking profits in some of the higher valued subsectors um, in, in our market. So, for example, software and, and rotating into some slightly more cyclical um, subsectors within technology, chip makers uh, and manufacturers of machines that make chips um, in order to sort of hopefully benefit from a, a reopening or an improvement in the economic backdrop. And then just lastly, since I am here today, and um, it, it might be worth mentioning that we, we also responded to the promising vaccine news by reducing some of our work from home exposure in the portfolios um, and rotating in favour of sort of reopening plays uh, in the form of travel assets, actually, uh, Booking.com uh, and Uber being good examples of recent purchases for our portfolios. Thank you.